Welcome to the Performing Arts Series brought to you by the Kennedy Center and the Prince William Network. I'm Maria Salvador, your moderator for today's program. This program is interactive and you will have an opportunity to ask questions of us later in the broadcast by using the 800 number or the email address appearing on your screen. We hope to hear from you. I'm joined in the studio by students of Brandy Provenzano from Battlefield High School in Haymarket, Virginia. Welcome. With us is noted author Linda Sue Park, who became a paid writer at the tender age of nine. Her work has received many prizes and numerous accolades. Her novel, A Single Shard, was awarded the Newbery Medal. This medal is presented to the author of the book recognized as the most distinguished contribution to American literature for young people in a given publishing year. Ms. Park finds the stories in history and in everyday life while she probes universal emotions. She tells these stories in different voices and in different genre, ranging from novels to poetry to picture books. We'll take a look at some of Ms. Park's work, how Ms. Park has come to tell these remarkable stories, perhaps glimpsing at her writing process, and explore how fact and fiction come together to create a memorable experience for the reader and the writer. Welcome, Linda Sue Park. Thank you. Your parents immigrated to the United States from Korea. You were born and raised in the Midwest. Tell us a little bit about your early years and how it came to influence your passion for reading and writing. Well, that's the main thing, is that I was a huge reader. Uh, I read everything. My father went to the library for me all the time. And I know part of it was growing up in the Stone Age, right? So no Nintendo, no computer, no um, DVDs, no videos. We had a little television, black and white, three channels, right? So there wasn't a lot of choice of the electronic media that young people have today. Books were everything. Books were stories and games and adventure and excitement, and it was all in books, and it still is. I think sometimes young people think, well, you know, books seem sort of static and boring, but they're the source of everything. They're the source of all the stories that go into movies and video games and a lot of the um, computer stuff that, that young people are so interested in these days. Everything starts from books. So I was a huge reader, and uh, somewhere along the line it just... Um, seemed to go together, reading and writing. I wanted to try writing some of these wonderful stories that I was reading. And I still think it's the, I mean, my job is to sit around and make up stories all day long. That's my job. That's a really cool job. Well, you started writing poetry. Do you mind sharing your first paid work with us? OK. This is a haiku. And it was published in a children's magazine in 1969 when I was nine years old. In the green forest, a sparkling bright blue pond hides, and animals drink. I was paid one whole dollar for that poem, and I gave the check to my dad as a present, Christmas present, I think. I had it framed, you know, because I'd heard you do this. The first money you ever make, you frame. So I framed the check, and like a year later, the magazine company wrote to me. Their accounting department said, we have it on record that this check has not been cashed. Would you please cash it so we can set our record straight? So it was for one dollar. But um, we wrote to them again to say that I'd had the check framed. And they said, basically, they wrote back a very nice letter saying, you dummy, you're supposed to frame the actual dollar, you know, not the check. <laughs> but <laughs> but uh, they said it was OK, and they canceled the check so that I could keep it. And my father still has it hanging over his desk. Did you make a conscious decision to write for young people after that? No. Um, at the time, when I wrote my first book for young people, it, I thought it was an accident. In hindsight, it wasn't an accident. I've always loved books for young people. I think the stories in them are terrific. And I think that the best adult books are like children's books in many ways, and that the story and the characters are very important. When I started my first book, I thought I was writing a short story for adults. I wanted it to be published somewhere like The New Yorker. and you know, um, But it, as I worked on it, it kept getting longer and longer and longer until I realized, this is too long for a magazine's story now. What is this? And I realized that what I had written was a novel like the ones I had loved when I was a child. And so that first book was an accident. 
since then, it's been a conscious decision. I realized, well, these are the books that I love the most, are stories for young people. And, and since then, I've consciously set out to write stories for young people. Well, you write novels, you write poetry, you write picture books as well as other forms. How does writing in these various genres differ? Does it call on you to, to, you to, for different things as a writer? Does it call on you as a reader differently? My first writings when I was very young, elementary school, little, were mostly poetry. I loved writing poetry, and I wrote poetry all the way through high school and college. And I'm really glad that that's how I started out because poetry is a discipline that requires you to look at each word carefully for the sound of it as well as the meaning, sometimes for even the way it looks on the page. And nothing makes you as conscious of words as poetry. So I see that my beginning in poetry has influenced all of my work. I still read a lot of poetry. Um, poetry is also the basis for many picture books. When you think about picture books for, young, for very little kids, um, you have only a few hundred words at the most to tell a whole story. So every word has to count. And that's training that I got from poetry. I try to my, my, write my novels that way, too. I try to make every word count when I write a novel. So I'd say that, that basis in poetry um, has really um, led to my writing in the different genres in some ways. Your first two novels are set in Korea hundreds of years ago. In Seesaw Girl, 12-year-old Jade lives in 17th century Korea. The two brothers in Kite Fighters live in 15th century Korea. Why did you write these novels so long ago, and f why did you place them so long ago and far away? What do Jade, Young Sup, and Ki Sup have in common with young people today? Um, those of you who are interested in writing, have you ever heard the um, saying, write what you know? You know, write the things that you know about. I think that's really great advice for a lot of writers. But to me, what I knew seemed boring. You know, I grew up in a boring suburb. You know, I, you know, my childhood didn't seem that interesting to me. Why would I want to write about it? I used instead, write what you want to know. What did I want to know? Well, I wanted to know about ancient Korea. And that was because, well, I look the way I do. I look like I'm Asian. And all I knew was American. I knew American history. American geography, ask me anything you want about the 1969 Chicago Cubs. You know, I knew American stuff. And when I got to be an adult, I realized, you know, I don't know anything about Korea, and that's where my family's from. So I started just to read about Korea. And as I said before, reading and writing go together for me. I was reading these really interesting things about ancient Korea, and I started to write about them because writing for me is a way of thinking. I have to be very clear in my head when I'm writing something, at least not at first. Sometimes I'm very confused when I start. But writing helps me clarify things in my mind. So I was reading about these interesting things about ancient Korea, like in Seesaw Girl, the fact that if you were a girl from a wealthy family, you were never allowed to leave your home, ever. You had to stay in your home your whole life because the society believed girls and women had to be protected from strange men. And that included strange men even just looking at you. That just blew me away. How could you live your whole life without ever leaving your home? And I wanted to know about that, so I wrote about it. And that's one example of how I use not write what you know, but write what you want to know. How do you think that relates to contemporary uh, readers? How do you think? Jade's life, for example, relates to? I think historical fiction is a terrific way to explore what it means to be human. OK, now, I didn't leave, live a life where I was behind closed doors my whole life. And yet, I think there are emotions that are the same. I think human beings feel fear and love and confusion and emotions like that, whether they lived 5,000 years ago or today. So historical fiction is a way for us to explore what does it mean to be human? What does it mean to be a person? 
And it's our emotional response to things. Our lives today in daily life are completely different, and yet we feel the same emotions that people from the past felt, and I think that people from the future will feel. And that, 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 that's what makes us human, and that's what I see as the connection between these worlds that seem strange and exotic. And today, I think that young people, no matter how different their lives are, they feel similar things all over the world and all through time. You deal in your second novel with kite fighting. How did you find out about kite fighting? And tell us more about that. That was my dad. Um, I wanted to do a sports book because I'm a big baseball fan, big football fan. Um, I've always enjoyed sports, not doing them so much as, as watching them. And I said to my dad, I'm thinking about doing a baseball book. But now I live in a soccer family. My husband is from Ireland. So my son plays soccer, my daughter plays soccer, my husband still plays soccer in a league for old men. You know, uh, we're just this huge soccer family. And I thought I was going to do a soccer book. I was on the phone to my dad, and I said, I'm thinking about doing a soccer book. And he said, oh, soccer's a great sport. When I was a kid in Korea, soccer was one of my two favorite sports. I said, what was the other one? And he said, kite fighting. And I said, you mean kite flying? He said, no kite fighting. And I said, what is that? I had never heard of it. Well, it's so cool. You fly a kite, your opponent flies a kite, and just using your kite and your line, you try to somehow get his kite to crash. Okay, there's a couple different ways of doing it. One way is just to maneuver your kite so it bashes his kite. You just try to hit his kite with yours, hoping that that will make it lose control and dive. And the other way is very sophisticated. You maneuver your kite so the lines cross, and then you pull on your reel so the lines rub against each other. Okay, so these really, really tight lines are rubbing and rubbing, and eventually one of them's going to snap, right? One of them's going to get cut through. And that kite flies off and crashes to the ground, and that's the loser. Well, I thought this sounded so awesome, and I had my sport. And kite fighting is still very popular today all through Asia and the Middle East. Japan, Korea, China, Thailand, Afghanistan, Pakistan, India, they still do kite fighting. And there is a United States Kite Fighting Association. Most of their activities are unfortunately on the West Coast. But if you're ever out along the beaches of California, Oregon, Washington, you can see kite fighting. It's still very popular. It's fascinating. Your third novel, A Single Shard, is set in 12th century Korea. It's the touching story of a homeless boy named Tree Ear and his longing to become a potter. How did you come up with the idea for this novel? Um, I was researching my first two books. And in every single book that I read about ancient Korea, I would come across a very short paragraph that would say something like this. In the 11th and 12th centuries, Korea was considered the best in the world at making pottery. OK, now I thought this was really interesting. My kids say to me, this is not interesting, Mom. <laughs> this is boring. <laughs> but I thought it was interesting because in English, you know, when you put fancy dishes on the table, you call that China. The reason we call it China is because of the country of China. The country of China, they invented the art of making this gorgeous pottery. And in the English language, the word for the pottery and the country became the same word. Okay. In other words, the reason that we call China, China, is because of China's China. Okay. So there was China, this huge, powerful country that had invented this art. And Korea was a very tiny, weak, insignificant country. But for 200 years, Korea's China was considered better than China's China. Okay, now how did that happen? It was like an underdog story. It was this little weak country that wasn't supposed to be good for anything, and yet they developed this art that was the best in the world. And I was fascinated by this, and I wanted to know what was so special about this pottery. Why was it considered so great? And I started researching it, and that became eventually the story that went into a single shard. It's fascinating. How do your characters, such as Tree Ear, Crane Man, and Min, resemble people you've either known or currently know? All of my characters have to have something of me in them. I think it would be really hard to make them real unless I could really understand what they 
are feeling. In a single shard, Min is really grumpy. I mean, he's a really crotchety old man, right? A lot of readers have told me that they do not like him. Well, I hope I'm not like him all the time, but I definitely have moments or even days when I feel like Min. And that's how I'm able to, I hope, bring him to life, because I, I share something with all my characters. They're also influenced by other people, probably by people I know well, um, my children, um, sometimes my husband, my parents, my siblings, my friends. Um, occasionally, there'll be somebody from um, early in my life, um, neighbors and friends, family friends, that I remember very well. I do have one author friend who, um, she writes mysteries and fantasies in which there's usually a villain. So when she's creating her villain, she thinks of all the teachers she had that she didn't like. And she, makes her, she gives her villains her teacher's characteristics. <laughs> I haven't done that yet, but it's not a bad idea. <laughs> <laughs> well, these characters come to life through your riveting plots. On Trier's journey to deliver Min's special Celadon pottery to the royal emissary, he stops briefly at the Rock of the Falling Flowers, a place with a story told to him by Crane Man. Will you share this, the scene in which he encounters the robbers? <clears throat> Tree Ear is on a long journey to deliver two very precious vases to the royal capital. And he has climbed this mountain as part of his journey and has a confrontation with a, couple of, with, with a, a man there. In the last moments, everything had come together in Tree Ear's mind. The man's pallor, his rudeness, his coming upon Tree Ear in such a deserted place. He was one of the dreaded Todoknon, the bandits who hid throughout the countryside and on the outskirts of cities, emerging only to rob weary travelers. Tree Ear held onto the wooden frame of the jigge with all his might. The robber pulled and jerked. Crane Man's solid straw work held. At one point, the man released one hand, cursing. The straw had cut into his palm. Tree Ear's hands were toughened by calluses from axe and spade, his arms strengthened by endless work. He gave not a single step of ground to the robber. Be careful, a scream of warning sounded in Tree Ear's head. You are pulling so hard. If he lets go, suddenly you'll fall. Move, move now, so your back is not to the cliff edge. Tree Ear shifted his feet and began edging sideways. Still the robber pulled, now shouting curses and threats with every breath. Soon Tree Ear's back was to the path. His arms and hands felt like iron. They would never break. He would never let go. The robber was weakening. He could feel it. Tree Ear stared into the robber's face. Hatred would give him more strength. And it did, too. Silently, he swore to himself that this dog of a man would never win the jiga in its priceless contents. The man stared back at him, his face contorted in an evil grimace. But suddenly, he laughed and released the container. Tree Ear collapsed backwards into the arms of another man who had stolen up the path behind him, a second robber. This scene takes place on, on the side of a steep mountain. Tell us a little bit about the landscape of Korea and its influence on Tree Ear and his story, and maybe even on Korea itself. I think the landscape we grow up in is very important to our characters. I think that's true of anybody anywhere in the world. I mean, you can just see it in people who are raised, say, in the rural south versus New York City. They feel differently about things. They act and talk differently. The, where we grew up is a huge influence on who, on the kind of people we end up being. Korea is a small country. It's a peninsula. The border is mountainous and, river, and rivers, and it's basically cut off from the rest of the world. It's almost like an island, right? And it's a very mountainous island. So people have traditionally lived in small villages pretty cut off from each other, right? That makes them a very independent people. They learn to rely on their families and on their small communities, and that's all. Because traditionally, for hundreds of years, they've had no other way of getting to other people. And so I think that that um, plays a part in all of my stories, in the character's awareness of the importance of depending on their families, of Tree Ear's 
determination to find himself a family because he knows that he, that, uh, how important it is in the environment that he grew up in. So for me, setting, both time and place, is always a huge part of both character and plot. And so character is influenced by where they live. Yes, absolutely. And the reverse? Yes, that's right. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Your next novel, When My Name Was Kyoko, is also set in Korea, but in a slightly more recent historical period, between 1940 and 1945, during the Japanese occupation of Korea during World War II. Tell us a little bit about this book and how you were inspired to write it. When My Name Was Kyoko is basically my parents' story. My parents lived through World War II as young people, but they never talked about it. They never said a word about it to us. Once in a while, they might make some mention of it, but they lived through a terrible war and never said anything. And this was, this was um, when I found out, you know, I realized, wait a second, World War II, you must have been kids. What was that like? And that was just a few years ago. And they started telling me stories, stories that they had not thought about in 50 years. And some of the stories were really remarkable. I was like, whoa, whoa, wait, how come you never told us any of this before? And what they said was, it was a terrible time. You know, there was a war. People were poor. People were starving. People were getting killed. Who wants to remember that? You know, they didn't want to think about it. And yet, I felt it was important. And they did, too, in the end, because when they started telling me stories, they couldn't stop. Just story after story after story came, came pouring out of them. And I was taking notes, and I was interviewing them on tape. And uh, there was just so much that I learned about this time in Korea, again, things that I wanted to know, that I started to write them down, and it ended up being a book. Well, you used two, two very different points of view in Kyoko. One is that of Sun Hee, who is a, a thinker and a, a, um, a poet, and she uses writing to, to very fluidly to express herself. Her brother is more impulsive. He's more action-oriented. How did you differentiate these two distinct voices when, when creating them? That is a very long story. <laughs> <laughs> we don't have enough time here. But the first several drafts of When My Name Was Kyoko were all written from the girl's point of view. Just one character, Sun Hee. She tells the story. And the book wasn't working. The story wasn't working. So I had to find a way to make it work. And eventually, after many, many drafts, I hit on the solution of having the brother and the sister tell the story in alternate chapters. Chapter one is the girl, chapter two is the boy. They take turns throughout the book. But I did need a way to separate them because I didn't want the reader to get confused about who was speaking. So because Sun Hee is a writer, I gave her a very fluid style. She thinks lyrically, she thinks in images, She's very poetic. But Taeyul, the brother, he's an action guy. So he had kind of short, snappy sentences, you know, that just were, you know, this is what I'm doing now, and this is what I'm going to do. And, and, and eventually, to make that even, to emphasize that even more, I put Sun Hee's chapters in the past tense. She's reflecting on it. She's thinking back on what happened and putting it into this lyrical language. I put Tayil's chapters in the present tense. This is happening now. This is what I'm doing now. This is what I'm going to, you know, this is what's in my head right now. And that's how it ended up being two separate voices, one in past tense, one in present tense. And if you would look at my computer, at the hard drive of my computer, the version that was eventually published was version number 37. I had to write that book 37 times before I got it right. Com compare that to, to the writing of uh, Single Shard. Oh, Single Shard was much easier. That was only eight times. <laughs> so but still revision, revision, oh, yes, revision. Oh, yes, lots of revision. <laughs> lots of revision. Well, Teyul describes how the Japanese impose the announcement about names. Will you share his, his reaction to this news, how he relates it? In 1940, the Japanese, um, who were the governing power in Korea at the time, made a law that every person in Korea had to change their name. They had to change from a Korean name to a Japanese name. And it's the only time in history that an entire the population of an entire country has been renamed. This is how 
Taeyeol finds out about it. There's a Korean word, abuji, which means father, and that's what's used here. Abuji reads aloud from the newspaper, by order of the emperor, all Koreans are to be graciously allowed to take Japanese names. Graciously allowed, uncle says. His voice is shaking. He's so mad. How dare they twist the words? Why can't they at least be honest? We're being forced to take Japanese names. Abaji reads some more to himself, then says, we must all go to the police station to register in the next week. Uncle curses and pounds the wall with his fist. My name, Taeyul, means great warmth. My grandfather, Abaji's father, chose it. It's one of our traditions for the grandfather to do the naming. He'd taken it seriously. He'd wanted a name that would bring me good fortune. For son, he too, girl of brightness. A different name? I can't imagine it. I look at Sun Hee and I can tell she's thinking the same thing. Those who do not register will be arrested, Abaji says. Let them, let them arrest me. They will have my body but not my soul. My name is my soul. Uncle's face is red as a pepper. Abaji holds up his hand. Such talk is useless. It must be done. But let me think a while. Well, to save his family, Taeyul later volunteers for the Japanese army near the end of the war and then volunteers for an even worse mission. You've captured what everyone feels in Sun Hee's voice about waiting and the effect of war. Would you share her diary entry, which ends in a poem? Taeyil has um, volunteered to go into the Japanese army and is now serving in the war. Nothing makes time go slower than waiting. And we were waiting for so many things, waiting for uncle to come home, for the war to end, and now, worst of all, waiting to hear what would happen to Taeyul. The first few days were terrible. Every time I heard a car outside, I was sure it would stop at our house, that it was the army coming to tell us what? That Taeyul was in jail or the other, which I couldn't say even to myself. A few days passed, then a week. Sometimes I thought I was losing my mind, that if we didn't learn something soon, I wouldn't be able to bear it. But if I couldn't bear it, what would I do? March into military headquarters and demand an answer? Take the train and boat to Japan to find out myself? I thought about asking my friend Tomo. His father was an important official. Maybe he could find out something. In the end, I did none of those things. I stared at my diary for hours at a time and wrote what I could which was only a few words. Uncertainty, a flower dying for want of rain, the nearest cloud, a world away. The two voices become very distinct, and I think listening to, to, to you read them, it echoes the different ways that a reader would read them. Well, thank you. I hope so. I hope they hear different voices when they're reading. Well, the idea of name changing and its impact is seen in both Kyoko and, and A Single Shard. Uh, Trier's name changes when he goes to live with Min, as do, do the Korean names in, um, under the occupation. What is the power in names? Well, names are so huge. I mean, because they are how we're known in this world. I mean, I say chair for this. And I say, Maria, for that. I mean, that's how we are known in the world, is by our names. So um, to change your name is, in a way, to change a part of yourself. In Tree Ear's case, it was by choice. He chose to change his name. And it was for a good reason, because he was going to be a member of a family now. For Taeyul and Sun Hee, it was traumatic because they were not being given the choice. They were being forced to change their names and forced to take a name that they did not want. And sometimes I, when I visit schools, I ask young people to imagine that. Imagine someone forcing you to change your name to a name that you do not want. I mean, I think that that just would feel really, you know, would, be a, would not be a, a good feeling. You know, I think that you would continue to think of yourself inside your own head as your original name. You know, um, I think it's changing your name is, would be a, a really difficult thing to do if it was something that was forced on you. Interesting. Your recent novel is quite different. Project Mulberry takes place now. 
Julia Song, a Korean-American middle school student, narrates the story of how she and her best friend Patrick come up with a special project for their 4-H-like club. Will you tell us a little bit about how this story came to be? Well, I wanted to write a contemporary story after four historical fiction novels. That was a lot of time in the library, a lot of dusty books and dusty shelves, and I decided I wanted to write a story that took place now. Um, I decided that they were going to do a science project together, and the science project they pick is silkworms. Okay, the fabric, silk, is made by silkworms. And the reason it's always interested me, ever since I was a little kid, is I learned that silk comes from the cocoon, right, of a silkworm. And it, silk is basically made out of worm spit, okay? <laughs> the worm spits out this stuff to make its cocoon, and that's how we get silk. So that always sort of fascinated me in kind of a gross way. Right? Well, I decided I needed to actually raise silkworms so that I could write this book accurately. But there was a huge problem with this, which is that I have a mega worm phobia. I can't stand them. I think, I mean, I have no problem with bugs, but worms just completely gross me out. So how was I, how was I gonna do this project, which would require having 40 or 50 or 100 worms in my house? <laughs> so <laughs> I called my dad and I called my nephew. And online, I ordered two sets of silkworm eggs, one set to my dad, one set to my nephew. And they raised the silkworms for me. My dad kept a very, very scrupulous diary. He wrote down every single thing that happened to his eggs. My nephew, who's much more tech savvy, he took digital photos almost every day so that I could, without having the worms in my own house, I could do the research through them. So two different sets of, of silkworms and eggs. And eventually, um, we, um, with my mother's help, because she had done this before as a young girl in Korea, we made silk from those silkworms. So that was fascinating. It was really a great project for the whole family. And uh, it ends up being reflected in, in the book, I hope. So out of the library into the laboratory. That's right. <laughs> <laughs> Your character, Julia talks to you very directly. In fact, your conversations with her are interspersed between chapters in which Julia narrates the action. You, since you're really both voices in this dialogue, um, would you share the first interaction between you and Julia? Sure. I'm going to read it to you first, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about it, because it is an unusual technique in fiction. You know how you get to the end of a chapter in a book, and you know it's the end of the chapter because you see some white space here. So you know that's the end of chapter. And usually you turn the page, you get chapter two, right? When you turn the page of this book, you do not get chapter two. You get a different typeface, and you get a graphic element that sets it aside, sets it apart from the rest of the book. That's on one spread. You have to turn again before you get to chapter two. That happens at the end of every chapter, OK? So chapter one ends, and you don't get chapter two. This is what you get instead. The narrator is Julia Song. She's a 12-year-old Korean-American, and she's doing this project with her good friend Patrick. It's in first person, and this is Julia. I've got another story to tell you, and I'm going to do it here between the chapters. Every story has another story inside, but you don't usually get to read the inside one. It's deleted or torn up or maybe filed away before the story becomes a book. Lots of times it doesn't even get written down in the first place. If you'd rather read my story without interruption, you can skip these sections. Really and truly, I hereby give you official permission. But if you're interested in learning about how this book was written, background information, mistakes, maybe even a secret or two, you've come to the right place. Some people like that sort of thing. It's mostly conversations between me and the author, Ms. Park. We had a lot of discussions while she was writing. Here we go. Me. Why am I named Julia? Ms. Park. You're named after my sister. Sort of. Her name is Julie. Me. What about Patrick? Ms. Park. Oh, that's just a name I like. But his character is partly based on a boy named Mark who lived across the street from me when I was growing up. 
Mark had five or six brothers and sisters, and he always had some kind of project going. I liked hanging out with him, and I was sad when he moved away after only a year in the neighborhood. I guess writing about Patrick is a way for me to spend more time with Mark. Me. Do you know what's going to happen in my story? Do you already know the ending? Miss Park. I have a general idea of how I want the story to go, but nothing definite yet. Really just you and Patrick and the project. That's all I've got so far. Me. Hmm, looks like you could use some help. Good thing I'm here. And I have one more question. The part about the friends who thought your house smelled awful. Did that really happen? Ms. Park. To me or to you? Me. Well, to you, of course. I know it happened to me. Ms. Park. Yes, but it happened to me in third grade, not fourth grade. Me. Is that, like, legal to change stuff like that? Ms. Park. It is if you're writing fiction. Fiction is about the truth, even if it's not always factual. I changed the fact about the grade, but not the truth about the feelings. Get it? Me. Yeah, I think so. Okay, do you see how this is going to work? On to chapter two now, and I'll see you on the other side. So that's how those sections work, where the character actually talks to me, the author, directly. And that happened because of when my name was Kyoko. Remember I said earlier that Sun He had the original version of the book? When I switched, I initially switched completely to the brother. I switched to Taeyo. And Sun He came and talked to me one night when I was in bed. She said, I am so angry. You take the story away from the girl, you give it to the boy, that's typical sexist stuff. I can't believe you're doing this. This is my story too, I want back in. And I was fascinated because the character had never talked to me like that before. She was right in my ear. She was right in my face. She was like, give me back with my book. <laughs> that's what she was like. So I was like, whoa, girl, OK, OK. And that's how it ended up being the two both characters. When I started Mulberry, Julia did that. She was talking to me all the time, and she was driving me crazy. So I started to type what she was saying to me. And the whole process ended up feeling like part of the book. So I, I put it in the book. That's interesting that Julia really literally came to life for you. Yeah, I guess not in, not in uh, not obviously in not her body, but yeah, she was, she was always bugging me. She was making me crazy. Interesting. Yeah. Interesting. Before we move on, I'd like to invite the viewing audience to start calling in your questions to the 800 number or the email address on the screen. We look forward to answering these questions. You mentioned uh, the smell of food that that uh, was, was very much in your life. From too much uh, or too little, the sights and smells of Korean food are in each of your novels. Why do you include food in all of your books? Yes, food is in all my books, right? Food is in all my books because everybody eats, right? <laughs> it's one of the most universal things in the world. There's a few other things that absolutely everybody does, but some of them are hard to write about. You know, writing about everybody sleeping is boring, but everybody eats. And food is also a great way to show character. I mean, young people know that right from the start. Oh, you know, I have one friend who always eats all his fries before he starts on his hamburger. You know, it's a great way to show personality, the way that somebody eats. So, I mean, I'm sure you can all think of people who do something, you know, that's a little weird or quirky with food. And so food is in all my books. I also think that with a novel, a novel covers what? A day, a week, a year in a person's life. Novels in which people don't eat drive me crazy. It's so unrealistic. You know, everybody has to eat. How can you have a whole book in which nobody eats? A picture book, maybe, but not a novel. So people eat in all of my books. Okay. Julia explores her biases and fears, as well as noting those of her mother in Project Mulberry, often with humor. Tell us a little bit about how and why you used humor to deal with some tough topics. I think that when a topic is difficult to talk about, in Project Mulberry, there um, are discussions about life and death. There's discussions about racism. There's discussions about ecology. And these um, topics are things that can bring out a lot of passion in people. 
which is great. But when people are very passionate about things, they tend not to listen to each other. Everybody's passionate and believing what they want, and they're not hearing each other speaking. Humor is one way to get through that. You make the person laugh, and then they're ready to listen to you. You know, you're much more inclined to be open to somebody whom you like, somebody who can make you laugh, than somebody who's just preaching at you. So humor, for me, is a device to get people to listen. Okay. We'd like to take some of your questions now. Let's start with uh, a call from Ripon Middle School in Virginia. Caller, go ahead. Do we have a caller? My name is Dennis Carter. I'm a student at Ripon Middle School. And my reading class wants to know how long did it take you to write the book about Kyoko 37 times? <laughs> Uh, how long did it take me to write the book about Kyoko 37 times? Um, well, if I count the research, the part about you know, reading about World War II, interviewing my parents and so forth, until the time the book was published, it took about three and a half years. So three and a half years altogether to, to write that book. So thank you for the question. We have an email from Rutgers Prep School in New Jersey. Um, was Min mean toward Tree Ear because he lost his own son? Was Min mean? Min, Min is really mean to Tree Ear in this book, and was it because he lost his own son? I think um, only Min could answer that. You know, you have people who suffer great loss in their life, and it does turn them bitter towards the world. Maybe that was Min's problem. You have people who are grumpy at the world because that's just the way they are. You know? yeah. I think for men it was probably a combination of both. But a reader helped me see something. Readers often help me see something in my books that I didn't see before. This reader said, Min makes beautiful art, just beautiful pots. He puts all the best of himself into his work, into his art. There's no good parts left over for people. Interesting. And I thought that was an interesting way to think about it. Interesting. We have a question uh, from our studio audience. Who's? Go ahead, please. Ask your question. <clears throat> I just wanted to ask: um, Do some of the events in the books um, take place in real life? Did you like put some of those in those events in your books? The answer is different for each of my books. In Seesaw Girl, there is a real historical event. Some Dutch prisoners, some, uh, sorry, sorry, some Dutch sailors land in Korea and are taken prisoner. That really happened in real life. In The Kite Fighters, there's a real king. There was a boy king of Korea. Because of different things that happened with his family and his father dying and so forth, he became king at age four. Okay? So he's a real character in the book. In A Single Shard, the pottery is real. All the pottery that I describe exists in a museum somewhere in the world. In Kyoko, everything that happened in the book actually happened to somebody, to a member of my family, to relatives, to friends, to kamikaze pilots whose diaries I read. So in Kyoko, everything happened in real life, although not all to one family. This all happens to one family. You know, I took from many different families and stories, but everything that happened in the book really did happen. And in Project Mulberry, um, the research for the silkworms happened, and many other events were taken from my childhood. But um, there are also, in all of my books, fictional things that happen. So um, yes, many things in my books do come from real life. But the emotions are, are all Emotions are all, all from real. my life, yes. We have an email from Michael in Washington, DC. It's a two-part question. Which authors do you enjoy reading most? And are you working on other books currently? Oh, which authors do I enjoy reading? I read still so much. And I have about 150 favorite authors. I, I read all over the map, fiction, nonfiction, adult books, books for young people, poetry, cookbooks, travel books. I read all kinds of books. This question I get often, well, who are your favorite authors? And it's so hard for me to answer that what I do is I direct people to my website www.lindasuepark.com 
And I have a section there on reading where you can see lists of my favorite books. And I have a blog. How cool am I? I have a blog. <laughs> <laughs> I blog about what I read. So at least once a week, I update a list of what I've been reading and how I liked it. So if you are interested in learning what I like to read, uh, go to my website. And the second part of the question? Currently working. Oh, currently, currently working, working, on. working on I have a new book coming out next spring, spring 2006. It will be my first fantasy. A kid is doing homework in his room, and all of a sudden, there's a warrior from first century Korea in his bedroom. His name was Chumong, and he was the greatest archer the world has ever known, bow and arrow. So he, all of a sudden, he's in this kid's bedroom. And the kid's like, OK, what's up? <laughs> what's up with this? And his mission in the book is to somehow try to get this warrior back to his own time and place. So I'm very excited about that book. It's called Archer's Quest. It'll be out in the spring. And um, right now, I am going, I'm actually not working on another book right now. This is the fall, what writers sometimes call the travel season. We do a lot of appearances like this one. We go to schools, festivals, conferences. So that's what I'm doing right now. And when I get home later in the fall, I hope to be working on another book. Wonderful. We have a call from Kingsley Elementary School in Wyoming. Wyoming. Caller, great. go ahead, please. How old were you when you started writing your books? How old was I when I started writing my books? I have two answers to that. When I started writing Seesaw Girl, my first book, I was either 10 years old or 37 years old. And I'll tell you why. When I was 10 years old, I read about those girls who were never allowed to leave their home, right? And as I told you, that blew me away. I knew right away I wanted to write a story about that. So I started thinking about it, started thinking about the story. Now, I didn't get around to writing it down for a long time. I didn't get around to writing it down for 27 years. But when I was 37 years old, I started my first book, and it was about that idea that I'd had when I was 10 years old. I knew exactly what the book was going to be about. I'd gotten the idea when I was 10. So what I want to say to young people is that you don't know for sure, but something you're learning right now, today, tomorrow, next week, it might be really important to you when you grow up. Pay attention, because if you're not paying attention, you'll miss it. Right? Pay attention to the stuff you're learning. Be enthusiastic, be curious, ask questions. And uh, so there's two answers to that. When Wonderful. did I start writing? We have another email from Rutgers Prep in New Jersey. Can you tell us what the differences are between modern and 15th century potter's wheels? Potter's wheels, well, an artist's question. Many potters today use wheels that are electric. You plug them in, they spin for you. So all you have to do is put your hands on the wheel, for those of you who are potters, and you don't have to worry about the spinning of the wheel. In 15th century or 12th century Korea, they would have used what's called a kick wheel. You kick the wheel with your foot to make it spin. So you have to do both. You have to work with your hands, and you also have to kick the wheel with your foot. Those kinds of wheels still exist today. If you go to some of the historic villages where I live in Rochester, New York, they have one called Genesee Country Village. They make the town look like it did a couple, years, a couple hundred years ago. You have Colonial Williamsburg. If there's a potter in a place like that, they will be using a kick wheel. So the potter's wheels, if they're not electric, of today and centuries ago are very similar. They haven't changed much at all. Interesting. We have, let's take a question from our audience. Please, go ahead. Um, in a single shard, you um, gave Tree Air a new name by, from his auntie. And you, at the end of the book, you still refer to him as Tree Air. I was just wondering why. Right. Great question. Um, Tree Air takes a new name at the end of the book. His name beca becomes Hyung Pil. And that name was chosen after a real person. But he still thinks of himself as Tree Ear. I still call him Tree Ear for the last few paragraphs of the book after his name changes. And it's partly what I was talking to you about before, right? He's just gotten this name, OK? So imagine that you've just gotten a new name. It's going to be an adjustment, right? It's going to be at least a little while before you think of yourself using that new name, right? So he's still so blown away. Remember, his dear friend Crane Man has just died. He's just been adopted by a new family. He has a family now. There's an awful lot going on. 
he's not in his head right now into, okay, I'm going to work on having this new name, right? It's too much for him. So he still thinks of himself as tree ear. And I hope, you know, in a few months, in a few years, living with Min and especially living with Ajima, he will get used to his new name. Great question. We have an email question uh, that's sort of related. Why did Min change his mind and finally accept tree ear? Yes, in the book, an important part of the story is that Min refuses to teach tree ear how to throw a pot because the potter's trade in Korea in that time was passed down from father to son and tree ear is not Min's son. To make matters worse, Min has lost his son. So he's very bitter and he's not going to teach anybody who's not his son how to do this pottery. However, by the end of the book, he's changed his mind and he is going to teach tree ear how to throw pots. Um, who, again, I think only Min could really answer that question, but in my head, Tree Ear proved himself. He went on a long and difficult and dangerous journey for Min, and he did it with no real reward in store for himself. He did it because he believed in Min's work and that this work deserved to be shown to the royal court, and so he made this journey. And when he came, and over the weeks that he was gone, I think Min thought, wow, you know, this kid is doing as much or more for me than a son would do, as a son would do. And, and, um, and I also think Min had such pride in his work that he wanted to pass it on to somebody. And this tree was obviously someone who was interested and someone who would, might carry on the work that Min had done. Talk, so he changed his mind. a little bit mind. more about work and the importance of work. Work is a, a large part of many of my books the time and dedication and working hard at something. I think that this is something really important that sometimes today's sort of instant pop culture gets away from. You know, you press a button, you can blow the enemy away in a lot of these games, right? Um, I think that work is something that has been valued through all of human history, and I don't want to lose that now. There are many ways young people can experience this in sports, a lot of kids work really hard at a sport. In music, a lot of kids work very hard to become skilled musicians, right? Um, I think that can apply to many areas of life. And so if a kid doesn't, have to, doesn't happen to be a musician or an athlete, they need to find a place where they can throw themselves into work with all their hearts. Because there's nothing more fulfilling, more satisfying, Anything that, nothing that makes you feel better about yourself than finding an area where you can work really hard and see the results. I think it's one of the most important things that you can do for yourself. Excellent. Okay. We have a question in our audience. Would you please go ahead? Do you consider yourself as one of the best um, authors? Do I consider myself one of the best authors? Oh, no! <laughs> um, because I'd like to be one of the best someday. You know, you have to have a goal. You, know, you have to have something you reach for. If I already thought I was one of the best, well, then you know, would you, maybe you'd just quit. I don't know. Um, I have authors I admire very much. I have authors I would like to be like someday. You know, so, so I will keep working. And even without comparing myself to other people, you always want to be better. You know, like I look at my stories now and I think, well, that was pretty good. But I'd like to write an even better one. And every time, that's my goal. I want every book I write to be better than the one before. So. Um, Maybe when I grow up someday, I'll be a really good author. We have another audience question. Yeah, um, how come all the, um, the main characters and all your books children? Why are all the main characters in my books young people? They are. And they're usually around 11, 12, 13, 14 years old. That's the age that I pick. Because I think that those years, between about 11 and 15, are crucial to becoming who you're going to be, right? Up until that age, elementary school, you know, little kids, your parents are huge in your life, right? You do a lot of, you know, a lot of the things you think and believe and that you know about from home are from your parents or from the people who raised you. In 11 to 15, that's the time when you come to depend more and more on your friends. Is that right? You know, your friends become a much bigger part of your world. You didn't get to pick your family, but you pick your friends. Okay? You, you were stuck with your family, right? 
You didn't get to pick them. You pick your friends. That's the first huge independent decision that young people are making. And that determines in a huge part what you're going to be maybe for the rest of your life. Some people change later. Some people change in their 20s or even 30s. But for, for a large part, those years, 11 to 15, whew, they're huge. And to me, they're the most interesting part of our human existence. And that's why I choose to make my characters that age. We have a caller from uh, Kansas, Hiawatha Middle School. Caller, please go ahead. Uh, what was your favorite book from your childhood? What's my favorite book from my childhood? That's also on the website <laughs> because I couldn't pick one favorite. I do have lots and lots of favorite books from my childhood. I can give you a few titles. I loved The Little House Books by Laura Ingalls Wilder. I loved a book called The Tree Grows in Brooklyn by Betty Smith. I loved the Nancy Drew mysteries. I read them all. I loved a book called I Juan de Pareja by um, Elizabeth Borton de Trevino which is about um, an, uh, a slave, an African slave, in the Spanish court. There were a lot of books that I loved, and there are many more on my website. Um, I have read all of the Harry Potters. So okay. far, I like number three the best. <laughs> well, we've just about run out of time, Ms. Park. Many thanks for being with us today. I'd also like to thank the students from Battlefield High School who came so well prepared, with a special thanks to their teacher, Ms. Brandy Provenzano. Thanks, too, to the viewing audience from across the country for tuning into the program. If you didn't get a chance to ask the questions that you wanted today, you can contact us by using the email address on the screen. We'd love to hear from you and answer your questions on today's program or any upcoming broadcast. Today's program is the first in the 2005-2006 season of the Kennedy Center Performing Arts Series. This season will feature a wide-ranging assortment of performers and presentations that can contribute to the educational enrichment of your students through music, dance, theater, and literature. We invite you to visit the Kennedy Center website at the addresses on the screen for more information about upcoming programs this season, as well as other resources on integrating the arts into your, into your curriculum. The next program will be broadcast via satellite and the web on Monday, October 3rd at 11 o'clock a.m. Eastern Time and will feature members of the National Symphony Orchestra in a program about the connections between history and music. Thank you for being with us.